one of the most important ingredients to living a good life is that you find a way to build the capacity to hope. I read a book recently called Life Worth Living, and it asks you to think about things in your life that you want to put in your life that make your life worth it. What makes it worth getting back at it tomorrow? What makes it worth waking up? Whatever that thing is, that's hope. We have a little house decor thing that we put on the wall or put on a mantle somewhere. I don't know where we got it, but I love it. It says, hope is planting a garden, and it's got a little bunny planting that garden. I like it. I mean, you wouldn't take the time to till and to plant, to work land, unless you thought there was something to stick around for. That's the thing about hope. I mean, it helps you believe that there's something worth believing in. And hope is the first of the five candles that we light this Advent as we all move towards Christmas. So this morning, let us think deeply about the hope in our lives. When I was at Emory University, I studied with Dr. Tom Long. I was going to read you a story that he tells. Now, I didn't write this. I just want to put that out right in front of you. These are his words. And it's a great story. And I just need you to know that if I tried a hundred times, I couldn't say it better than him. So I'm just going to read his words. So here we go. This is Dr. Long. In her book, Intensive Care, the author, Mary Lou Wiseman, tells the moving and tragic story of the death of her 15-year-old son, Peter, from the terrible disease of muscular dystrophy. She tells about an astonishing thing that happened right at the moment of Peter's death. Peter's body was completely paralyzed in the final stages of his disease, and the delirium of death was taking over his mind in the last few minutes of his life. He was moaning. It was random and disconnected thoughts. His voice, wrote Mary Lou, sounded so far away, so lost. But suddenly, in a surprisingly clear voice, Peter spoke directly to his dad, Larry. Daddy, what does impudent mean? Frightened, Peter's parents looked at each other, wondering what a strange question for their dying son, and what could this possibly mean? Daddy, what does impudent mean? Even though he had tears streaming in his eyes, Peter's dad mustered up the courage to say, it means bold, Peter, shamelessly bold. Peter paused for a moment, death closing its grips on him. Then put me in an impudent position. Moments later, Peter died. But right before, his parents positioned his arms and legs in a bold defiance, an impudent position as he turned to face death. I told you it was a great story. I mean, this is more of what we mean when we speak of Christian hope. It's an impudent position over and against the powers of death. It's more than planting a garden. It is standing shamelessly bold in the face of death. So I do a lot of funerals. I have eulogized in my time as a minister over a hundred different people's lives. I mean, think about that. I've attended countless more funerals. We had one here yesterday. I am around funerals almost every month of my professional life. Sometimes we have multiple in the same week. Here is what I've come to learn. There are two preachers at every funeral. The first 
is capital D death. Death stares at the face of everyone in the sanctuary and it preaches a sermon with authority. And that message is the same every time. I win. I always do. And next, I'm coming for you. Now, the other preacher in the room is usually somebody a lot like me. And we always have to follow death's agonizing sermon. And we've got to come up with something. We stand before the same group of people as death. And we have to offer words. And if we aren't careful, we will fail to rise to the level of the moment. But if we dare... If we lean in to the community's collective grief, if we lean in to the moment that it presents itself in the room, then we have a chance. We have a chance to offer the community an impudent word, a shamelessly bold, defiant word that shakes its fist at death and declares beyond a doubt, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? If we preachers dare to say it right, then something magical happens in the room. The room feels it. The depth and aliveness of true, authentic Christian hope. If we do our jobs right, the room doesn't walk away tormented by death's sting. Rather, we leave impudently. That's Christian hope. It's believing in your bones that capital D, death, doesn't win. It will want you to think that it does. And it has a compelling argument. But capital D, death, cannot withstand God's love Capital D, death, doesn't tell you this, but death, the actual act of dying, it's just a door. It's not a coffin. Death is a destructive and sad door that closes chapters in time with people that we love. But it is never the final act because in Christ, there's always more time. In Christ, there's always more life. In Christ, there is always something to hope for. And standing at the precipice just four weeks before Christmas, as we usher in Advent for our community, we should stand impudently. Stand ready. Stand shamelessly bold, defiant, even in the face of capital D death. Because in a world of deep grief, sorrow, and shame, our Christian hope reminds us that none of these things get the last word. Suffering doesn't win. Disease doesn't win. Capital D, death, can say whatever it wants, but it doesn't win. Love wins. This is why Christians should face both life and death with hope. I love this thought so much. Hope gives us the resolve that we need to stand impudently, shamelessly bold, and position ourselves over and against the powers of darkness. Because despite the visible evidence, Christian hope reminds us that love will always outlast hate. Life will always be bigger than death. Peace will defeat war. Grace will outlast disease. To believe any or all of this is to carry in your soul hope. So then the work of faith is to learn to hold on to this hope, even in your darkest days. And we can stand in the face of darkness because God's bringing a new day when all that is broken gets restored. Our Christian hope puts the church in an impudent position over and against the power of capital D death. It positions us 
a lot like Jeremiah tries to do in his oracle today. So hear these words again. Verse 14 from chapter 33. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It's hard to know exactly how the Judeans would have heard this verse, but we can't help but hear it in the light of Christmas. Especially that line, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promises that I made. And that promise is the same promise that was made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and Deborah and Ruth and Esther and Saul and David and Solomon. And that promise is on the lips of Jeremiah. And that promise is despite the sorrows and despair we feel, despite the wars and the death we endure, there is hope that salvation is coming. So go ahead and stand in an impudent position. And look how Jeremiah says it in verse 14. It will be for the house of Israel and for the house of Judah. I mean, to hear phrases like this, Israel and Judah, that matters. Jeremiah is saying that salvation is coming for all of God's people. Remember, they split the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south. But this tells us in Jeremiah's oracle that Israel's dissensions, their fractures, they don't matter at the salvific level. God's salvation comes to us all. There's a Christmas message in that little detail. Look at verse 15. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. These verses are chock full of just important words that burst off the page. Branch, righteousness, saved, safety. When God comes, the fear, the wars, the enemies, the pain, the grief, it all goes away. So Israel and Judah can stand in an impudent position, knowing their current situation will get better soon. So what is their situation? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) We date Jeremiah around the 7th century before Jesus, and he is a southern kingdom. He's from the southern kingdom in Judah. He spans the time when Jerusalem was sacked by the Babylonians. All the Judeans were thrust into exile. So he's writing to people who have been destroyed by war, evicted from their promised land. Their central temple and resting place for their God has been destroyed. They have no home. They have no legacy. They have no foreign aid and no promise of a future. Now enter Jeremiah and this powerful oracle. It might seem terrible now, but hold on. It might seem impossible to imagine. But the day is coming. A branch is growing. So don't be afraid to stand, Judah. Stand in hope with a shamelessly bold, defying, impudent hope. Believing that despite the darkness and despair that you feel, the day is coming when I'm going to make it all right. And that day will feel Now, Jeremiah doesn't say this, but we can't help but hear it this way. The day will feel a lot like Christmas. So look for it. Stand ready to see it. And then when you do, shine it. Because this little light, it shines hope.